I'm gonna do the intro on my YouTube land. All right, so that's it. Welcome to the program on conductor opacity and protection. Um, we are going to have two hours of fun and uh, we are going to uh, be covering, uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about ampacity of conductors and protection of conductors, but what I really think is gonna help, I know it helped me, is gonna be that question, the, the problem that, um, that I sent out on, on my LinkedIn site and my Facebook site, et cetera. So Kathleen uh, is uh, entered a chat Kathleen, the, the problem is in is described in this Menti code. Um, we've got more of a detail. Let me just pull that down a little bit. Uh, we've got more of a detail out on my Facebook and my LinkedIn site. So you can go check that as well. But if you click on this, you'll see the problem overview. I've got some slides in the beginning. So it'll give maybe for those who want to do double task, you can get uh, a little bit of both worlds and try to answer the question. All right, I got a healthy stream out on YouTube and I'm out there on Facebook. Thanks for everybody for joining us, Salvador Ramirez. Um, greetings from Costa Rica. Thank you for joining again. Let's see, while during our live stream, can you discuss why the NEC has not changed the three volt ampere lighting per square foot? LED lighting has changed. I'm, I'm gonna do a load calculation um, session and I might cover that in the load calculation, but if we have some time, we can talk about that. All right, I'm just looking to see about uh, any chats out there and make sure that everything is going fine. All right. Got some communication updates going on. We've got a good healthy number of people out there. Everybody is, uh, that is on, um, everybody out there on WebEx, I've muted you on entry. Please be mindful, don't hit that little red uh, uh, microphone uh, and, I'll have to play whack-a-mole and try to figure out who is talking when they should not be. So um, I appreciate, uh, and if uh, and, and if you please leverage the chat in WebEx, please lever the, leverage the chat out there on YouTube land and on Facebook land. So I do have to say in the uh, at the beginning of this, just that uh, anything that, that we talk about, anything that I say at least is my own opinion. I, although I'm on various NFPA, UL, IEEE, and other uh, committees. I do not speak on behalf of, of uh, those committees, nor uh, NFPA, nor any other organization. Anything I say is um, my opinion, my opinion only. And uh, please use the chats when you uh, think that I'm off base, uh, or if, uh, if you can contribute something to the conversation. I know that uh, over the last few weeks, that has been going very well. I appreciate everybody's engagement. Um, I've actually had somebody uh, in my organization tell me that they learn uh, even more from the chat sessions because, uh, you know, these types of forums, we, uh, I like to bring everybody together and we have a great discussion. Uh, there are a lot of smart people on this, uh, on the WebEx and on YouTube and on Facebook. So, you know, I'm not the sharpest spoon in the drawer. And, uh, but I'm only as dull as the dullest, the dullest person on these uh, WebExes because I know you guys and gals will keep me honest. And that's what I count on. Uh, Menti code for attendance. Menti code for attendance, 98, 67, 84. So I know you guys, 98. Some, oops. I am just chatting that out to the WebEx people for the attendance. I know I started right on 12 and there's always those a little bit late. So we're gonna talk uh, circuit protection and um, understanding, uh, you know, uh, circuit complete circuit protection is a lot more than just uh, picking the right circuit breaker or fuse to provide protection uh, for, the, uh, for the system. It's uh, you have to select the right conductor for the application. And we reference various tables in 310 to help us pick that. We have to think about 
uh, not just the opacity, but we have to think about the environment that that conductor is going to be in. Uh, that, for example, uh, is it going to be in a wet location, a damp location? Is it going to be uh, protected in, in, in raceway? Is it going to be exposed? Uh, you have to understand the conductor's application and make sure that you pick the right conductor for the job. You apply the ampacity to calculate the ampacity of the conductor correctly based upon its conditions of use and then provide adequate, adequate protection both from a short circuit overload and I put physical protection in there as well because we, we have to consider uh, the proper physical protection. There are a lot of code requirements and, and sections. Uh, probably I won't, I'm not going to hit them all, but uh, there are a lot of areas in the NEC that speak to protection of a conductor uh, from a physical perspective as well. All right, so let's talk about selecting the right conductor. You know, we use NM wire a lot, but it's not the universal product that goes everywhere. Uh, we have tables in 310 uh, that we leverage, and it's, I think, 310.4. Yeah, 310.4, I got it right there. So if we look at table 310.4 in the National Electrical Code, uh, what I like, what's nice about that is it has it has your trade names, it has your type letters, your maximum operating temperatures, your application uh, provisions, and, and you'll notice in that column where it tells you that it has dry and damp locations or dry and wet locations, you'll see the insulation types, etc. cetera. Um, so when we're applying, I, I know a lot of people probably on this, on our, on this, in this session right now that's watching this, they have those standard conductors they use in probably 90% of the applications and they probably don't even go to this table uh, that often because their applications are very similar in nature. They know what to use when they're pulling wire inside of a facility, when they're pulling wire inside of a house, whether it be in conduit, if they're going outside the circuit, they know exactly what they're using because they've already gone to 310.4 uh, at some point in their life and picked that. Or uh, or their, the, the PE that they worked under, if they were an engineer, or the, um, the journeyman that they worked under, if they're an electrician, uh, told them uh, what they are to be using. Because at some point in their education, they've, they've, uh, they've gone through this analysis. So we leverage 310.4 and table 310.4a to help us understand what conductors to use in what applications and what the, the limitations are of those conductors. Um, this is a table out of an IEEE book. And a reference I'm going to use. So I'm I'm looking at the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code. I do have the 2017 version. I have the 2014 version. And I go back to the 30s and the 20s behind me somewhere on that shelf. Um, a couple good references for you, uh, for the engineer, for anybody. I, I, you know, I say engineers, but, you know, the IEEE buff book, which is IEEE standard 242 is a great reference. Uh, the title of this is Protection and Coordination of Industrial and Commercial Power Systems. Really good reference book. You can still buy this. You can probably find it on eBay and other locations. Uh, I give away all of my extra copies to various people that I've met that found an interest in them. So I only have this. You can go out to IEEE and purchase a PDF version uh, of the latest versions. Uh, my book is 1986. My electronic versions are a lot uh, later, but or early or later, I guess. I don't know how you'd say that. They're newer, right? So, but I personally like some of the older books because uh, over the years in these, they pull information out because I think sometimes we get into a mode of, of um, you know, I call it uh, by this. Uh, if you've ever if you've ever five vest a, a um, uh, your office or your house or whatever you're throwing stuff away and then I don't know about you but you know years later you look back at it and go man I wish I had that one piece of information or that one item that I that I tossed and you gotta go out and buy it again well they they've they've changed these books they've moved information around they've pulled things out they're in the process right now in IEEE to update these to a dot standards uh, because books like the red book which is IEEE 141 so these are what they call the color books you've got IEEE standard 141 which is electric power distribution for industrial plants 
Uh, there's a lot of good information in here that uh, would be applicable for industrial plants. This is just general, but there's a lot of overlap between these two, uh, but, the, <clears throat> but they're great for your library. Enough about that. That's where this table comes in. And what this shows you is um, <clears throat> uh, based on insulation type, some of the maximum voltages that you can apply those at and the maximum temperatures. And you'll see a maximum operating temperature and a maximum overload protect, uh, temperature and short circuit temperatures. And we're going to have a discussion about when you talk about conductor protection, you got to think you have either a copper or or a um, aluminum conductor with which is wrapped normally for un, for ungrounded conductors and even grounded conductors, but uh, not your equipment grounding equipment. Not normally your equipment grounding conductors are bare, but most of these conductors are going to have an insulation around them, and that insulation serves a couple purposes. Uh, one, it insulates us from from touching it. Uh, it also help provides protection for that conductor. Uh, Etc. But um, th if you think about copper versus a uh, rubber insulation or uh, oil-based rubber or polyethylene or EPR, all of these different types of components, those materials that surround that conductor will melt well before you melt the copper. So when we look at thermal damage curves, uh, you're you're looking primarily at uh, heating that conductor to a point where it damages the insulation, if that makes sense. All right. Uh, so the so we provide um, you have to pick the right conductor, understand the insulation ratings, what can be used in all these different types of environmental conditions that we're going to place them in. Another thing that we have to think about is short circuit protection. Uh, to do that, to to evaluate a conductor for short circuit protection, I have to understand the short circuit currents. I have to understand the capabilities of the conductor from a short circuit current rating perspective. Uh, how uh, you know for very large currents what how much current and for how much time will it either damage the conductor itself uh, the the copper or aluminum uh, you know think about copper and aluminum you have what they call an annealing point uh, vapor if, whether you're going to vaporize that conductor or you're going to anneal it to a point where it can stretch and deform under the lug or wherever it's at um, <clears throat> So you're thinking about uh, different methods, and, and there's there's the underdog method. There's a few other there's a few methods that help us understand uh, the protection of that uh, when that conductor itself uh, either um, either will fail because it uh, again it meets its annealing point or or it vaporizes whatnot. So uh, we understand that heat through a conductor is a is a can be calculated from an I squared R value. And we have to understand that that conductor can, will the, 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 the copper or the aluminum will heat up to a point, how fast will it heat up uh, based upon these high fault currents? And if you think about uh, very high short circuit currents, the overcurrent device is gonna clear so fast that you're not looking at uh, the, the heat impacting the insulation uh, so much as it's raising the temperature of the uh, conductor itself and it, it we don't give it enough time to you need hours to raise the overall temperature of that conductor so when you have a high short circuit you're really worried about um about damaging that conductor to a point where uh, you're having an annealing point or you have the you, if you're going to vaporize that conductor and uh cause it to uh disintegrate basically based upon the magnetic forces and whatnot so uh, so we have what we call those damage curves, short circuit damage curves uh, that are basically a nice straight line. We plot those in SKM and maybe I'll bring up my SKM. I got some plots of thermal of the uh, damage curves uh, based on some uh, previous plots that I've done, et cetera, and, and, and diagrams that I've been able to obtain. Uh, but uh, it, we can pull up some examples if we want to. So... For the short circuit, the overcurrent protective device is going to give you your short circuit protection. We want to clear the fault uh, within so many cycles so that we don't damage the conductor and the insulation. And there's uh, equations for that. Uh, the, uh, the ICEA, the uh, for aluminum conductor, so that, that equation, it's hard for me to read on this screen. It's bigger over here. 
that I over A squared and, and the logarithmic uh, equation that you see there, we use those equations to help generate the uh, damage curves for conductors. And I'm, I'm more used to seeing curves at, uh, in SKM and in other applications like EDSA and Easy Power in this manner where you have current in amperes across the bottom, uh, like a regular time current characteristic curve. I have current across the bottom, I have time up the, uh, up the axis on the left. And what you'll see there, they have time in seconds and then cycles. I know a lot of uh, electricians and a lot of people talk in cycles as opposed to seconds. I'm a seconds individual because I come from a time current characteristic curve world where I'm looking at current versus time uh, in seconds. Uh, but um, a lot of people will be referencing uh, cycles, which is 0 0.016, one cycle at 60 hertz, that's 60 cycles per second, one over 60 is one cycle, and uh, that is 0 0.016 uh, seconds of, uh, of time. So when you look at this, what you'll see uh, the one cycle, two cycles, four cycles, and that corresponds to approximately 0 0.016 uh, seconds. If you look at, uh, like on this curve right here, that's your one cycle is about 0.016, pretty close to 0.02. So uh, they, they basically, I like the fact that they give you the, um, the cycles on this, on this time current characteristic curve. What this shows you, though, is the short circuit protection for that conductor. Uh, it, for any current in any one of these uh, conductors, you've got the size of conductors across the top, okay? We have our time up the side. We have current across the bottom. So for any one of these conductors, so if I look at a number 10, if I put in, and these are current times 10, so 20,000 or 2,000 amps, 2,000 amps, I go up. Whoa, that was terrible. Ray saw link. So if I go up and over, whoop, let's go over this way. I usually go over to the left. That'll tell me for 2,000 amps, how much time it would take to damage the insulation on this conductor, if that makes sense. So, uh, and, and then you can see the clearing times for different circuit breakers on the right-hand side. And, and as the conductors get smaller, you really need fast clearing times. And that's why when you get down to the small conductor size sizes, there's some special, um, uh, special uh, things you need to think about from an overcurrent protective device perspective to make sure that you provide that high short circuit protection because these damage curves are pretty far to the left. Uh, when you plot a time current characteristic curve in our selective coordination, now we've had a couple times uh, this, I think, uh, did we talk this week? Well, I'm losing track of uh, my programs here. I believe we talked uh, the selective coordination breaker tables this week. I believe it was last week we, uh, we had a selective coordination or the week before. Uh, uh, selective coordination presentation uh, that talked about uh, the time current characteristic curves and, uh, and and we talked about how we plot the motor damage curve and we pick our overcurrent devices to let those motors starts those motors start we also plot the transformer damage curve and we plot the inrush current uh, the primary overcurrent device has to let those uh, motors uh, or let the transformer energize and for a conductor I'm not energizing a conductor. There's no inrush currents because I energize a conductor. Uh, but, uh, but I do have a, a damage curve, a short circuit and a thermal damage. We're gonna talk about the thermal damage curve. What you're showing right here is the short circuit uh, uh, damage curve for a, for a conductor. And that's basically what it looks like. It's just a straight line. And usually it's way over there on the right on our time current characteristic curve. Now, short circuit damage temperature limits are, again, much higher than those for, uh, like if it's a non-insulated conductor. So if you think about a bare copper conductor, and I haven't, I went down this road a while ago, I wanted to plot the damage curve for a bare copper conductor, but really a bare copper conductor, all of the damage curves that I've ever seen, all of the stuff that you're gonna see in, in SKM that I could find in SKM, I don't have Edsa or Easy Power, uh, anything that you see out there, any of the equations that you see, talk about insulated conductors. The there's like a couple data points that you have to worry about for a bare copper conductor. You want to you don't want to melt it, uh, you don't want to anneal it, 
Okay, we we talked about those uh, a couple of those things from a copper, just a copper conductor perspective. And your equipment grounding conductor, uh, you've got to make sure that you have an effective grounding path, etc. But you want to protect that equipment grounding conductor as well, so you don't want to make it too small uh, because uh, ground fault currents could pass through that. And you want to make sure that your overcurrent device clears those faults fast enough uh, so that you protect those conductors as well as your uh, ungrounded uh, conductors that are insulated. Uh, but the uh, but a bare conductor with no insulation. If if my if my damage curve, if this damage curve is is here for an insulated conductor, my bare copper conductor damage curve is probably way over here somewhere because I'm. It's going to take a lot more current for a lot more time to get to the point where you melt the conductor, as opposed to melting the insulation. Okay, I don't know if that makes sense. Hopefully, that makes sense. Uh, overload protection. Uh, overload protection, this is, again, from an overload, uh, when you think about it, short circuits, short circuits will, um, will go outside the path. That's why those fault currents are so much higher. I'm not sure if I have some slides in here where I talk about that. I don't want to jump ahead. I do. I do talk about that. Uh, so let's just uh, stay on overload protection. Overload protection, again, this is you have the ampacity of conductor, which is based on its conditions of use. It's not a rating of the conductor. It's not a, um, uh, I remember the terms we used to use before, the, 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 the NEC and the in previous cycles of the 2020 used the terms rated ampacity or allowable ampacity. We had a task group work in the, during the 2020 cycle. We removed those. Uh, the ampacity of a conductor is based on its conditions of use. And the normal current carrying capacity, when you start to exceed that, uh, you're going to, you for if you exceed the ampere rating or the ampere, uh, uh, the ampacity of a conductor for a long period of time, you can uh, create enough heat to damage the insulation. These are lower currents because they're staying in the path for long periods of time. Uh, 310.15b, so when you think about the impacity of a conductor, uh, 310.15b, I'm going to look at the title of that just to make sure I, I don't want to say something wrong. Those are just the title of 310.15 is the impacity tables, and B are your ambient uh, temperature correction factors, and uh, you have adjustment factors in C, and, uh, and, and A is a, just a general requirement. But what we have to do with our, our conductors is we have to adjust the ampacity based upon how many device, how many conductors, it's conditions of use. And the two key parameters are how many you have in a raceway. Because if you look at 310.16, the title of the table, 310.16, where we get our ampacities, and this goes for 310.16, 17, 18. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to reference 310.16. The title of 310.16 says, Impacities of insulated conductors with not more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, cable, or earth directly buried. So it, the moment I have more than three current carrying conductors, I, I have to do something to, these t to the ampacity values in these tables because these ampacity values are based upon the conditions of use as defined in the title of the table and in the footnotes. So uh, what 310.15 helps us with is how it provides the multiplying factors to adjust those ampacity values for those conductors. Now, you can approach an ampacity calculation from one or two different ways. If you know your load current, uh, like uh, in our case, we know our minimum circuit ampacity, uh, our MCA number based upon uh, the the air conditioning units that we're looking at, right? They gave us an MCA. I could reverse engineer that and say, okay, I'm going to take that value. I need an ampacity value. Take all of my adjustment factors and divide by that, which will increase the the amp the amp rating of the conductor that I need, and then st strictly go to 310.16 and pick the right conductor. Or I can work the other way and keep doing the multiplying factors on um, on the 310.16 table numbers to get down to a number that will, uh, that will get me greater than my minimum circuit ampacity. So oh, either way, 
uh, you're going to get to the same number. I chose to, uh, in my problem, uh, take the MCA, which is probably what everybody does, uh, take that minimum circuit ampacity and start dividing by, by the multiplying factors for adjustment factors for uh, more than three current carrying. We call, when we, when we consider more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, we, and we adjust, that's called an adjustment factor. When we do a, a uh, multiplication, uh, a multiplier for temperature, that's, that's referred to as a correction factor. I believe that's, uh, that's what we use. Uh, ambient temperature correction factors. So if you look at 310.15b, and I'll tell you what, it don't mean a hill of beans to me, whether you call it all a correction or you call it adjustment. I, I, I think I called it uh, ampacity uh, uh, derating. Ooh, man, those are like, that's like swearing to somebody. Um, that's like using a swear word when you're talking to a conductor guy, cable guy. You, you, you don't uh, derate. I think, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think they look at it as being vulgar. I don't know, but um, um, you're going to adjust the ampacity based upon uh, those conditions of use. And that helps you understand what the ampacity is, which will lower that number. So because if you don't do this, if you don't adjust for the the temperature of the environment, nor the uh, nor the number of conductors in a raceway, normal load currents would could be an overload for that conductor based on its conditions of use. So you need to make that uh, adjustment. Now, it can take about one to six hours for the temperature of a cable to stabilize after you change that load current. So you think about, I mean, you have a, you have a, you have a, 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 a conductor of a large mass of copper and insulation that you need to raise that temperature of. And it takes about one to six hours to raise the temperature of that cable, you know, after stabilization based upon changes in load current. So, so you're not talking when you're when you think about protection of a conductor due to overloads you're talking a very long period of time of a persistent overload to be able to start to impact damage to the insulation we plot a thermal damage curve so if you're familiar with the short circuit uh, the short circuit protection is usually stopping right here and that's your short circuit protection this portion of the curve is what we would look at for a long-term thermal overload of that conductor. Uh, and, and I normally don't see that plotted. And I'm not sure why, personally. Um, I, I know when I bring up SKM, I'm, I got to, I'd have to play with it. I never really, I've never really played with it at all because I was never, ever really worried about that because my overcurrent device for these conductors is, is usually like way over here, right? If it's a fuse, if it's a circuit breaker, you know, those, the protection of those conductors is way over there on the left. And I never see a, a case where um, I'm worried about uh, the protection of that. As long as I'm following the rules in the National Electrical Code or based on the manufacturers, you know, I'm picking the, the overcurrent protective device based upon the adjusted ampacity of those conductors, et cetera. So in any case, um, you know, we have to make sure that we, we size and we calculate the right ampacity so that when we pick our overcurrent device, it provides protection. But, uh, but that, is, that top portion is your thermal damage curve. All right, so now physical protection, you got the mechanical hazards from Article 300.4 uh, tells us, uh, Exhibit 300.1, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. I'm not sure what version of the code, some of these slides I, I, I based that on. 300.4 is really, Oh, yeah, yeah, 300.4, yep. Exhibit 300.1. I'm just checking my references real quick. But 300.4 is that large table that we talked about earlier that tells us uh, when we pick uh, table 300.4, when we pick, not 300, no, 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 that's 310.4, 300.4. 300.4 is uh, titled, I want to get the right title, Protection against physical damage. Yeah. So, and then uh, 300. Dot, uh, uh, exhibit 300.1 is your, I'm not sure what that one is. But in any case, 300.4 gives us 
uh, when we when we route cables like through wood wood members or uh, the types of cables that we're using, how we properly protect those conductors, you know, nails and screws, metal studding, et cetera, sharp edges. Uh, if you have adverse uh, ambient conditions, uh, foreign elements, all, all that good stuff, you got to think about the physical protection of the conductor. You got to pick the right insulation for the application. Uh, ensure, I know that in 300, I think it's 300.4, somewhere in there, there is a requirement to put plates if you're down around those areas where you might have screws and nails, et cetera, to protect uh, like NM wire, et cetera. If it's going through pipe, if it's going through pipe, then you don't have to worry about those types of protection because the pipe offers that protection. Raceway, conduit, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, so you have Article 240, 300, 310, and, and I threw 440 in there. Um, I've had these this slide for, for quite some time, these sets of slides for quite some time. Uh, I added 440 because specifically because of the problem that we were reviewing um, uh, is an air conditioning and refrigeration unit. It's an air conditioning unit up on three air conditioning units up on the roof. So Article 440 is, is, uh, is important for determining the overcurrent protection uh, of uh, those, uh, say, branch circuit from an overcurrent and from a short circuit protection. And I believe if you look in Article 240, uh, there's 240.4G uh, that talks about um, other sections of the code. So you have uh, 240.4G, table 240.4G in the 2020 code. Again, my references are going to be in the 2020 NEC. Uh, there's, it's a nice table that tells you to go to parts 3 and 6 for the air conditioning and refrigeration equipment. If it's a capacitor circuit conductor, you go to 460. If it's a control and instrumentation, instrumentation circuit, you go to 727. So what, what Chapter 2, what Article 240 is telling you is that in some cases, you, you need to go back to the specific application whether it be chapter four, chapter six, chapter seven, um, to look at what the requirements are there for protection of that conductor. And, and I threw 440 in there specifically because that is our, uh, that's our, our question that we're going to be looking at. So heat's generated in the conductors by I squared R loss. And, and you think about it, you're, you're heating that copper conductor and then that heat just basically finds its way out through the sheath, through the insulation, um, uh, through the conduit, anything else that it's uh, that it's uh, the raceway or whatnot that it is uh, it, it is in. And I noticed just now that Mr. Joe Andre joined us out there on Facebook. Thanks, Joe, for joining us. Another, I'm telling you, we've got an audience of experts. Who, uh, Joe, please uh, you know, contribute in the comments. Uh, and anybody else, please contribute in the comments if you have uh, comments on uh, items uh, on anything that we're discussing here. So you, uh, you're looking at the resistance of that conductor current passing through the, through the conductor, heating the conductor, and then it makes its way uh, out through the uh, system. So how I, uh, if I have a conductor in open air as opposed to uh, maybe in a raceway of some sort, or if I have bundling of conductors, that uh, limits the ability to dissipate that heat. And that is why we, we will have to impact the uh, the ampacity of that conductor. We have to take those in, under consideration. Okay, so the insulation protection uh, is a thermal, a one of thermal and short circuit. So long-term currents and, and very high short-term currents. We've got to think about that. We leverage the short circuit protection curve and we leverage the uh, thermal damage curve. So, and I showed that there are two portions of that, which if anybody out there, if there are any engineers who do uh, Selective coordination studies where they're plotting the conductor curve. If you uh, plot that longer uh, portion of the curve, um, I'd love to hear from you. You know this 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 curve here. If you if you're plotting that, I, I'd I'd love to uh, let me know in the chat if you if you're actually plotting that. I've only plotted in my history. If I've only plotted this uh, this curve here, which is the short circuit protection, for the same reason that I, I noted before, because that overcurrent device is so far to the left that I don't really have to worry about that. All right, so let's now talk a little bit about overcurrents. Why would, uh, what is an overcurrent? Why would I see overcurrents? Uh, what am I protecting from? An overcurrent, again, is, an overcurrent is a generic term. Overloads, short circuits, and ground faults are all overloads 
or overcurrents. Um, an overload is an overcurrent, a short circuit is an overcurrent, and what, what the NEC tells us is we have to provide overcurrent protection, uh, which in incorporates all of those. Now, not all of those would be, could be providing the protection for a conductor. You may have the short circuit protection from, say, the circuit breaker or fuse, and you may have the over. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you may have the over uh, overload protection done by, say, a overload heater element, or it may be a part of the air conditioning unit, so to speak, the the uh, the unit that the the controller and whatnot that's that's managing the starting of the motors and all this other good stuff that's in the AC unit. The the overload protection. Uh, in in many, if not uh, most cases, are in those closer to the motor. So your your breaker or your fuse is just providing short circuit protection uh, and ground fault protection. Uh, so an overload is uh, it's again it's uh, operating in excess of its normal full load rating or of a conductor in excess of its ampacity. And we just changed uh, rated. Uh, we removed the words rated from the 2020 code as part of a task group that I chaired uh, because rated ampacity doesn't have a place. It's all ampacity is based on conditions of use. So when I exceed the ampere, uh, um, the ampacity, which is based upon the conditions of use, I'm in an overload condition. And if it persists, for, I, can, I can live with an overload. Uh, and, 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 and we talked about it takes like one to six hours for me to heat up a conductor over time, uh, I can live with short durations of overload. Uh, if I have a motor on a rock crusher or a motor driving a, uh, uh, a conveyor belt that I'm standing on, right, or, or a treadmill that I'm standing on, uh, it's going to pull uh, higher currents than full load amps. Uh, I may exceed the ampere, uh, the ampacity of a conductor for short periods of time, perfectly fine because I'm not gonna generate enough heat to damage the insulation uh, because it's not persistent long enough. Uh, so ampacity is the maximum current from Article 100. Um, I'm, I'm going to look and see because I don't know that I have the entire uh, definition there. I just sort of paraphrased, I believe. Uh, I'm going to open my... Uh, I'm sure you guys are opening your code book. I know you are. Ampacity is the maximum current in amperes that a conductor can carry continuously under the conditions of use without exceeding its temperature rating. And we already talked about that. The key word there is under its conditions of use. And, and if we're using table 310.16 to determine the ampacity, the conditions of use are clearly defined in the title of that table and in the footnotes. And we're going to talk about that as we work through our problem. Now, short circuit currency is, is not defined uh, in the National Electrical Code, we do define, we entered a new definition in the 2020 cycle, which uh, is called fault current. Uh, and a fault current is the current delivered to a point on the system during a short circuit condition. Uh, you think about it as going outside of the normal path. You know, if I'm in an overload condition, then I am going to be, uh, I'm going to see an increase of current in my conductors because I've added loads. And when I, when I add loads, if I persist long enough, I'm going to heat those conductors and I'm in an overload condition. You, you, you've, you've got to re recognize that an overload is when current stays in the normal path. So if I look at a normal circuit, uh, each of those resistance values could be your uh, conductors based upon the length, and uh, the, the, the impedance values found in the, the table, I think it's table nine of the NEC. Let me just double check. Uh, I like to uh, make sure that I have the right MPS. So table nine in the National Electrical Code gives us the alternating current resistance and reactances. So each of those could be different lengths of conductors going down to a load. The load's going to draw a certain uh, amount of current. In this case, the load's uh, the load resistance is 24 ohms. Uh, each of the conductor uh, impedance or resistance values are 0.01. So uh, the total amp values, the total current flowing in that circuit is 19.93 amps. <clears throat> Piece of cake, right? So um, the moment my fault goes outside of the normal path, that's when my fault currents, because I've taken out the loads, my fault currents will be very high 
and that would be your short circuit or your fault current values. And we, we created a new definition in the NEC of available fault current, which is the largest amount of current capable of being delivered at a point on the system during a short circuit condition. So we go through our power distribution system, we calculate the fault currents, and we compare that with our interrupting ratings, our, sh our short circuit current ratings of equipment. Uh, but we will also plot the damage curves and make sure that those fault currents and the overload currents won't damage the insulation of a conductor. Now, uh, uh, the fine print note in 240.1 tells us overcurrent protection for conductors and equipment is provided to open the circuit if the current reaches a value that will cause an excessive or dangerous temperature in conductors or conductor insulation. So again, you know, for, for short duration overloads or long duration overloads, you can have a, a quite a, you can have an overload for quite a long period of time on a conductor before you get into damaging the insulation. It's all about current and time, how much current you're going to permit uh, for how much time. Uh, all right, so I'm just going to take a quick check out on our YouTube and uh, uh, make sure I still have a excellent connection. I do. Um, I see. Ah, I see. Mr. Air is out there. That's scary. Scary. Doesn't the source impedance come into play with a fault? I didn't see that on the diagram. Yes, it does. Uh, that Kevin, you are absolutely right. I. You know what? I can tell right now. Kevin's a power engineer, power systems engineer. Um, you do have your Thevenin equivalent as you're looking back to the source. Um, and that would be, uh, you know, you would model that. You could model that anywhere in your power distribution system. Uh, but yes, you're right. You do have a source impedance and, uh, and voltage that you would model. And that, that diagram that I had was just simply to help people understand uh, that fault currents go outside of the path. They will be much, much higher uh, than, um, than your normal overload currents. Uh, article 430.6C, what is an AC adjustable voltage motor? And when does this article apply? 430.6, AC adjustable voltage. Uh, you know, you're, now you're getting into, um, you can control the speed of a motor multiple ways. I can do variable frequency. I can do pulse width modulation. I can control the voltage and control the speeds of a motor and whatnot. Uh, AC adjustable voltage motor is gets into the adjustment of the speed, and it's a type of controller. Can't seem to find it in NEC 2017. What table is? Uh, what table is? I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Um, let's take a look at, um, just taking a look at some questions before I go into any further here. All right, so greetings from Texas. I'm, uh, Arizona, we got Arizona represented. We got New York City, Maryland, Louisville, Kentucky. Is it Louisville or is it Louisville? Louisville, what is it? Scranton, Pennsylvania, Trinidad and Tobago. We're going to have to Google that one. Um, Michigan. Excellent. Zach, thanks for joining us. Costa Rica, thanks for joining us, David. All right, so I'm looking for questions. Potential stumbling blocks specifying. Yeah, yeah. So um, THHN, THWN versus THWN2. And I do have a discussion about that in our Louisville, in our later example, because uh, if you use THWN-2, which is your 90 degree C insulation. You don't have to follow the 75 degree C columns when you do your D rating. You can use the 90 degree C columns, but it's a good point, Ryan. Um, it's a place or see you, Mr. Greetings from CR. Oh, there we go, number four to race with. Oh, so, okay, so I'm getting some answers too. I'm, I'm, we're gonna look at the, um, at the link to see if you guys, I uh, see if I got it right. You know, <laughs> I did my calculations, but, uh, I may be wrong. So, okay, I'm going to take a look at my chat on WebEx, uh, Louisville. All right, so let's move on. Determining ampacity. Now, here is our question that we propose to everybody. We have a raceway installed. Uh, we, we, you note that it's on a rooftop. Uh, we've got three AC units. Oh, we got Phil Simmons. Woo, man, we got a powerhouse. Look at that. Look at that on Facebook. I got Joe Andre, Larry Air, Phil Simmons all joined. Now I'm nervous. I'm sweating, right? Um, all right. So one raceway is installed to supply three, three phase rooftop AC units in Atlantic Beach. So what does that tell me? I know that I have three phase and I'm going to AC units. Um, so I know how many conductors I have per unit. So I can calculate how many conductors I have in each of the, in that raceway. 
I have a, um, I know I'm on the roof. So if you recall, there were some, there was a bunch of changes. I think it was the 14, uh, 14 book around here. The 14 code book uh, made a change uh, for rooftops and then it was modified, I believe in the 17 code. It was changed and then I don't believe that changed in the 2020 code. So uh, I based my calculations on the 2020 NEC. Um, so so I, that first sentence in then Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, uh, and I would love to see some discussion out there. I got the Joe Andres and the Phil Simmons of the world and the Larry Ayers of the world. Where, where do you get the ambient temperature uh, for use? I, I Googled and I found a site and I pulled 94 degrees Fahrenheit for for Atlantic Beach as, uh, as I think I think I used an average uh, temperature, if I'm not mistaken. Do you use the hottest temperature? Do you use an average temperature? Where do you get the temperature for ambient? I talked to a friend of mine, Donnie Cook, a little bit about that as well. And there's there's debate about where do you what is the ambient temperature that you use. So if you uh, if you have any comments on that, I'd love to see that in uh, whether you on Facebook, YouTube, or uh, or WebEx. Doesn't matter to me where it comes in. Love to hear your thoughts on ambient temperature as well. Um, so, so if you look at, I have three units. Uh, we're given the minimum circuit ampacity. So MCA is minimum circuit ampacity. And MOP is maximum overcurrent protection. So uh, I know what my ampacity value needs to be for this uh, AC unit. And I know what my circuit breaker or my fuse needs to be for this unit. And I could get that off of the custom, off the literature. I have a picture of a nameplate. Uh, Mr. Cook sent it to me actually last night, so I threw it in there. I got to give him credit for that. Donnie Cook, Shelby County, Alabama. Uh, and the raceway is, um, in this case, um, metal conduit, and it's two inches above the rooftop. Now, that's an important thing. Now, what, the, what you, what you got to think about, uh, if you look at uh, in... 310 uh, if you if you if you followed your history on the national electrical code it was it was a controversial item indeed uh, the 14 code put some de some <laughs> i almost said derating factors um, uh, but uh, ampacity temperature correction factors uh, in for when you are on a roof and then it was modified in the 17 code i believe um, but uh, but there is you have to take into special considerations when you're on that roof or if your conduit, your raceway is touching the roof or whether it's, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the distances, three quarter of an inch or whatever, uh, off of the roof and whether or not you have to add additional multipliers. Now, in this case, the, the design engineer needs an equipment grounding conductor in all of the raceways. And, uh, and they've picked the THHN, THWN conductors for you. Now, uh, I would say that um, if you picked a different conductor, uh, you might say, well, hey, I can do a THWN-2 and uh, I and a THW, THWN-2 will give you a 90-degree uh, C uh, insulation rating as opposed to a THWN, uh, which, uh, which doesn't give you the 90-degree C. It's a 75-degree C. So if, I, uh, if, if you understand, which we'll talk about, as we apply our factors, if I have a 90 degree C insulated conductor, I can use the 90 degree C column in 31016 to do my uh, adjustment factors. Uh, but if I have a 75 degree C uh, conductor, like I have here, a THWN or a THHN is 75, I need to use the 75 degree C column. I can't use the 90 degree C column as I'm doing my adjustment factors. Uh, so in any case, um, there was something else I wanted to say about that. Um, the conductor selection. So you you may uh, you can run the numbers, and I believe I did. I did run the numbers off of the ninety degree C column, and I I believe uh, I show in at least in my calculation. You'll tell me if I did it right or wrong. Um, the value of uh, equipment grounded conductor and uh, or the ampacity of the conductor that I came up with, based on the THWN dash two. So, so the question basically is based on all of these information, what is the size of the ungrounded conductor? So your, your conductors that are feeding power to this unit. And then also what's the size of the equipment grounding conductor? Um, we're going to walk through this as we move through this presentation. We're going to come up with those answers. And if you uh, please look at the chats, I, um, 
I put a link to the Mentimeter, and I'm going to do it again. Uh, if you uh, oh, if you have the time to uh, to uh, to to walk through that, please put your answers out on Mentimeter, and we will uh, see what uh, what that looks like. So I'm going to put it back out here again on Facebook. Hit enter. I'm going to put it out there on the live uh, on my live stream uh, da -da 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 link. I'll put it on my chat. So if you uh, if you want to do the math, come up with an answer. You can put your answers in. It's an anonymous uh, tool, so you can put your answers in there. Control V. Enter. All right, so I see I see Don and and others uh, coming up with some numbers, and they're and 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 he's saying you uh, that uh, some about an answer being wrong for unit one. We got sixty two point three, so we got uh, so use uh, I used ninety four, I think ninety four degrees Fahrenheit as an ambient temperature in my calculation, so you can uh, calculate if I'm right or wrong. Uh, so, but this is the. Um, this is a label off of, an, uh, of, of a, a three-phase unit, a train uh, air conditioning unit. And, and what you'll see is that it, you have the electrical rating, 460. This is not one of those that were in my, in my calculation. If I would have had this image, I would have made this one of my uh, HVAC units. But you'll see the minimum circuit ampacity uh, shown. And you will see, so the minimum circuit ampacity is here. All this, uh, some critical, whoa. Hold on. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, I got to figure out how to. So there's some of the information that we that we're using on uh, for our calculations. Minimum circuit ampacity for this one is 30.2, and the maximum uh, circuit breaker. Or, I mean, I can't even read that. It says 35. MC plus MCB. I'm not sure what that says there. Um, but in any case, uh, the other thing to remember is that if you look, and Donnie Cook and I had this discussion last night, so in, in the top part, you have the, the MCA and the information that you need for, for doing all these calculations. But if you look down below, uh, you'll see that if you have a standard evaporator motor, and if you have an oversized evaporator motor, you have different minimum circuit ampacities and uh, maximum overcurrent protective lights. Uh, MOP uh, values in there. So, so you have you have 30.2 minimum circuit ampacity for a standard evaporator motor and 31 for if you have the oversized evaporator motor. And you have to know what's installed uh, to be able to make sure you pick the right uh, numbers. So uh, the, the nice thing about our, our problem is, uh, or you know, our, our problem that we're looking at now, it's given to us. Uh, so we don't have to maybe... Uh, Maybe Ryan or, or uh, one of the other dudes out there can uh, come up with uh, can come up with uh, an example uh, on based on a, on a nameplate value. All right, so you would think that uh, you go because it's a branch circuit going out to those conductors. That's a branch circuit. You would think, hey, I'm going to go to Article Two Ten because it's a branch circuit. And and if you look in uh, Part Two of uh, of uh of uh, 210 that has branch circuit ratings so you have 210.19 talks about minimum conduct minimum ampacity uh, and size and and you have uh in in 210.19 a you talk about uh you know uh, general requirements and other loads etc and you would think you know if you tried to do that calculation based on this you probably wouldn't have the right answer because uh, you treat this uh air conditioning unit a little different so the the I guess the 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 little lesson that I had uh, that I, that I would provide is that you know uh, you've got to think about this code book in a holistic perspective that there's a lot more than than just one area if you think you automatically go to two ten go to two ten nine nineteen to figure out the minimum ampacity and you base all your calculations take the uh, minimum circuit ampacity number and you start doing the gyrations of uh, that you find in two ten point nineteen that would not be uh, the right thing to do. Uh, if you look at part one of 210, it tells us that uh, uh, the air conditioning and refrigeration equipment, you should go back to 440 to look for information there. And as I noted earlier, even in 240, 
uh, table 240.1, uh, 240.2 or 240.1, uh, or 240.4G actually sends us back to uh, Article 440 for air conditioning units, Part 3 and, and 6. So, uh, and if you know, Part 3 in 440 is branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection. And Part 6 in 440 is your motor compressor and branch circuit overload protection. So, uh, you've got to go back to 440 since there is an article that focuses on this. We, fo we go back to Article 440. And we look at parts three, which is your branch circuit, short circuit and ground fault protection. And we look at part six uh, for motor compressor and branch circuit overload protection. Now, if I go back to 440, this tells me that the article applies to electric motor driven air conditioning and refrigeration equipment into the branch circuits and controllers for such equipment. Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, and I would love to get uh, others uh, feedback on this. Um, as I navigated Article 440, it can be confusing. At least it was confusing to me. And I spoke with a few other people about this. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, so you have a, okay, good, good, Ryan. So, but, but as you navigate 440, for these types of like this unit is a is a is a, is a piece of equipment that's listed. It has a minimum circuit capacity, it has a maximum overcurrent protection. So it's giving you that information. There's a lot of stuff in 440 that is is necessary when things aren't as clean cut as this unit is. And you can I can really get lost in in 440 trying to figure out uh, some of the requirements. You know, we 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 do certain things in 4 related to certain equipment but if you really ask yourself where in the code does it say you can do that you in some cases i know i had to do some hunting peck and i talked to two individuals and said where in the code does it tell me i can do this that i'm doing in this in this calculation and we both all three of us had a hard time finding it so uh, it's going to be a challenge i'll put it out to guys like ryan and david and 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 others who are viewing viewing this joe andre etc uh, to help me and uh, help others know exactly where in the NEC in, in chapter four or 440 does it tell us I can do certain things. And when I get to that area, I'll let you know. So 441.1 gives us the scope, right? Uh, but it's supplied by both brand circuits and, and all that good stuff. So ampacity and rating is 440.6. It talks about the size of the conductors for equipment covered by the article shall be selected from 310.16. So... That tells us, uh, that's again, that's our ampacity of, of insulated conductors with not more than three current carrying conductors. Uh, 310.16 through 310.19, I used 310.16 for this example. Uh, or you can calculate it in accordance with 310.14. Mean ambient temperature 93 according to station 8 km far from Atlantic Beach, excellent. Um, so 310.14, this is this is what I, I I can't I can't be looking at chat and doing this at the same time because it just gets me it's like squirrel uh, so ampacity for conductors rated zero volts to two thousand volts so three ten dot fourteen is your ampacity of your conductors so the required ampacity of the conductors and and rating of equipment shall be determined in accordance with four forty dot six a and four forty dot six b a talks about hermetic refrigerated motor or compressor and b uh, talks about multimotor equipment. Now, if I look at part four in general uh, for branch circuit conductors, 440.31 gives me general requirements. 440.32 talks about single motor compressors and then motor compressors with or without additional motor loads, combination loads, and then multi-motor combination load equipment. Now, if I look at each of those, 440.31 talks about uh, uh, that specifies the nameplate of a conductor required to carry uh, so, so part four and article 310 specify the ampacities of conductors required to carry the motor current without overheating under the conditions specified. So you remember, you have two things. If you have, when you have motors, you have two things to worry about. You have that, that, that equipment protection from, from a heating perspective. Those are the long persistent. And then you have to just make sure that the motor starts from inrush. So you, you, your curve, the, your overcurrent protection uh, and whatnot have to fit between those two. Your conductors uh, are, are primarily concerned with that um, 
conditions of use to carry that motor current without overheating. And then your, your, your locked rotor amps, your, your starting currents are going to be so short, you're not really worried about that heating the conductor to failure. You're more worried about your persistent overloads. Uh, and then there, and again, uh, exception number one says, where so marked the branch circuit selection current shall be used instead of the rated load current to determine the rating ramp capacity of the disconnecting means, the branch circuit conductor. So if it's marked, um, then you can leverage that marking information. Now these have, and we talked about these, uh, this equipment is telling us a minimum circuit ampacity and a maximum overcurrent protective device. And, and we are given in this, in this uh, uh, problem, a minimum circuit ampacity. These are the numbers we're gonna think about. Now, the, when you have a piece of equipment that is listed, and it's marked with a minimum circuit ampacity, it's doing a lot of the details that you find in 440 uh, for uh, you know, the, all the different parts and pieces that are inside that one listed product. They're telling you that's all you have to worry about. You have to make sure that your conductors, based upon the conditions of use, can handle 41, 18, and 59 amps. You don't have to go through uh, the uh, you know, continuous load, non-continuous load, uh, and do that calculation, do the uh, adjustment factors for uh, conditions of use, and then take the larger of those two, you're given the minimum circuit ampacity, and that's what you have to go from. Uh, you don't have to do any of those other things. You don't have to go back there to 210, uh, uh, chapter, uh, article 210 for branch circuits to do those sizing. You base your information on 440 and what's on this label. All right, so now the notes in 310.16 tell us these, this is where, so, so the title of 310.16 tells us three current carrying conductors in a raceway, right? The notes to table 310.16 talks about the, uh, the ambient temperature correction, the opacity correction factors based on ambient, and 86 degrees Fahrenheit is our number. So in my case, uh, I picked 94, I saw that Hansel, Mora says 93. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, anybody else, let me just take a look and see if anybody else came up with uh, any other temperature values for this area and where they're getting them from. -dum -bum 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 -bum. I'm not seeing anything, Louisville, Kentucky. Nope, all right, so, so I based mine on 94 degrees Fahrenheit. You may have picked their 93 or you may have picked something a little higher, 100 and some, depending upon where you're getting it. I would love to know where, where AHJs or um, other people are, get their ambient temperatures from. It's probably argued and debated uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, I would imagine. Uh, so 310.15c1 tells us that uh, uh, it should be referenced. So three, the, the table footnotes tells us uh, that we should be looking at 310.15c1. 310.15 is your opacity tables. C is your adjustment factors. And one is more than three current carrying conductors. And this gets into discussing um, uh, your correction factors when you have you know, more than those three, those three conductors in a raceway. And then uh, uh, 310.16 is reference for conditions of use. All right, so, and then, uh, and for overcurrent protection for your small conductors, you'll see that, uh, now that's for overcurrent protection, but I don't have to worry about that either because I'm in 440 now and I'm looking at the labeling of this, which is, it's telling me what my maximum overcurrent protective device needs to be. Uh, I don't have to go back to 240.4D to look at small conductors to determine uh, an adjustment of that amp, amp value, et cetera. I can use 310.16 in this uh, example. All right. So with no adjustment factors, uh, just straight for for each of those. So I'm I'm looking at um, if if you know we're giving the minimum circuit ampacities. If I'm not going to consider any adjustment factors for uh, for for conditions of use, whether it be condu a number of uh, conductors in a raceway, nor in a uh, an, a um, uh, nor a, a correction factor for temperature, then I'm going to use that 75 degree C column because I'm using THWN or THHN conductor, it's a 75 degree C insulation, and I could come up with my minimum, with my uh, conductor sizes based on that. Uh, for uh, 
for my my continuous current carrying uh, my my um, more than three con continue three conductors in a raceway uh, insulate uh, more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway. Jeez, oh man. I'm going to go to 310.15C1, and I know I have, what, three uh, HVAC units. So I have, um, I have uh, three conductors per, so I've got nine conductors in a raceway, right? So if I look at um, table 310.15C1, I know that I'm going to be at a 70.7 factor for nine current, I got it right there, nine uh, uh, current carrying conductors in uh, in that I don't have a neutral and if I did have a neutral and now if you have a you know if you're not dealing with this and you're dealing with a neutral then you've got to look at the balance and, <clears throat> and come up with that uh, determination if that neutral is going to carry current or not um, the equipment grounding conductor wouldn't be considered because it does it's not a current carrying conductor um, so I would just consider nine conductors and I come up with a 0.7 factor 70 percent all right so and then um, the rooftop adjustment factors, that's your 310.15B2. <clears throat> so I'm going to read that one for you. 310.15B2 talks about rooftop, and it says, For raceways or cables exposed to direct sunlight on or above the rooftop where the distance above the roof to the bottom of the raceway or cable is less than 7 eighths of an inch. And I could be wrong, but 7 eighths of an inch, probably a DIN rail. Probably. Uh, it's probably the dimension of a DIN rail. So you put, if you just put your raceway on a DIN rail, uh, then you, uh, you are, you're covered where you don't have to worry about the duration. But if you are on directly on the roof, so if we redid this calculation, which would be a good exercise, maybe I'll do that afterwards, um, or if somebody else wants to do that <clears throat> as we speak, um, if you put that right on the roof and you don't have that three quarters, uh, that seven eighths of an inch, then you're going to have to add an additional factor. And it says um, a outdoor temperature or a temperature adder of 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Celsius, shall be added to the outdoor temperature to determine the applicable ambient temperature for application of the correction factors in table. So you add uh, more temperature on to, uh, your, uh, to your existing ambient temperature, and that will be your adjustment. Now remember, if you remember in the 2014 code, there was, uh, a, you know, so I don't know if your state is on the 2014 code. There are there are some jurisdictions out there on the 14 code. You're not going to be doing that. You're going to be using um, uh, different multipliers because they added uh, additional multipliers regardless if you're on that roof. Uh, so Ryan, uh, 7 eighths is a shallow strut. Thank you. Uh, so it is a shallow strut dimension. Excellent. Well, I don't know what I said, uh, uh, but in any case, yeah, shallow. I didn't say that. I know I didn't say the word shallow. Okay. Um, but up, but up, but up, but up. THWN is 90 degrees. THWN is 90 degrees. Is that right? THHN, TH, THW, THWN is in the 75 degree C column in my book, the 90 degree is THWN-2. So you have to have a, T, a dash two at the end of THWN for it to be 90 degrees. All right, so take a look at 310.16. Uh, in fact, what I'll do is uh, in a dry location, 75 in a wet location. Okay, uh, good point. When I'm in a raceway, when I'm in conduit, is that a dry or wet location? I'll look for the chat. If I'm in conduit, is that a dry or a wet location? Uh, most installations on a roof are exposed to sunlight. Yep. Thank you, Ryan. Wet location, 300.9. And that's why we're using that 75 degree C for THHN uh, and THWN primarily because uh, it is a wet location. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you for that clarification. And I will put that in my notes as I go through this because that'll improve uh, the message there. Table 310, uh, 104, all of our supply houses stock THWN-2. So you may, that's true, you know, you may just pull THWN-2, but in this case, they were using THWN, and, and it's be mindful of that so that uh, you don't use the 90 degree C, use the 75. 
Most installations on a roof are exposed to sunlight. Would the adjustment still apply regardless of height? No, uh, because in the code, uh, it says uh, for raceways exposed, as long as you're greater than seven eighths of an inch off the top of that roof, and what that's accounting for is air circulation around that raceway, the conduit, et cetera. You would not have to worry about this adjustment uh, just because you're on that roof. Now, if you're on the 14 code, they would beg to differ. The 14 code cycle, you had that additional dust adjustment. So, <clears throat> all right. Hopefully I answered that question. Okay, so um, so now uh, our roof, no need to adjust for 310.15B2 for that reason that I'm not uh, less than 7 eighths of an inch. So unit one has a minimum circuit opacity of 41 and a maximum uh, overcurrent protection of 50. Common current, or common, geez, current carrying conductors is, uh, for my for my adjustment factor is 0.7. So again, you can do this one or two different ways. And, and I actually, at one point I did this the opposite. I took the entire, I have a spreadsheet, which I didn't show, but I took the entire table and did the multiplying factors so that you can adjust the ampacity of all those conductors based on uh, your your um, uh, current carrying conductor modification and your temperature uh, adjustment. And uh, and and you know six to one half dozen another. Uh, it's easier just to do this. Take forty one divided by 0 0.7, and that tells you that your ampacity of a conductor needs to be at least fifty eight point six, right? For that adjustment. From a temperature perspective, I have a 0.94, and I reason and how I got 0.94 is, <clears throat> excuse me, I used uh, table 31015B1, 31015B1. I'm going to just do something here. Bear with me. 31015B1. I'm going to move some chats. Oh, I forgot about the WebEx chats. Someone's uh, wrestling around. On WebEx. Uh, participants. Please remember to mute. I hear somebody shuffling some papers. All right, so I was going to, while I do this, uh, I'm going to just try to call up the code book here. And as I do that, um, nfpa.org slash 70. All right, I'm going to look, as, that, as that's coming up, I'm going to take a look. Outdoors, depends on where the conduit is located. Yep, and this is on the roof. It's outdoors. Uh, true, could be an interior wash down area. Yep. I would like to hear thoughts on why 210.23 for multi-outlet brand circuits are restricted to fit, blah, blah, blah. And any other words? All right, that's a little bit different, Eddie. Sorry I bumped uh, enter before I was finished. Okay, 7 ace is half strut. All right. Um, I'm going to move this out of the way. All right, so uh, what, you, what I did here was, um, I'm just going to try to get my book open so I can bring up that table. Uh, so adjusted for temperature, I have 62.31 amps. And then uh, from, so, so I, I adjusted for more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, and I got 58.6 amps. And then I adjusted that for uh, temperature, and I get 62.31. And now I need a conductor from 310.16 that uh, can handle 62.31, and that would be a number six. That would be a number six. And I'm going to do a couple things here. Sign in on that. Oh, man. Um, a Dimitrovich at Eden.com. As that's logging in, I'm going to bring up the um, Mentimeter. And I'm going to download the latest and see uh, how many people said number six. Take a look at the chats. I'm going to scroll up on the chats. I don't know if I think somebody up there had given some ideas. All right, so I'm going to open up the spreadsheet. 
And as that's opening, so my first uh, answer is a number six for the current carrying conductor. Cell is opening. 77A, so I don't see, I thought, Dawn, you put a note in there somewhere. So let's take a look at, uh, at the YouTube. HWN-2, I see all that. I'm going to scroll all the way to the top. David Engelhart, you had a number six on unit one. So you got the same number as I did. Ouch. Even though I don't know, I'm not sure what you used for temperature, ambient temperature, but you have that. All right, so let's take a look at the Excel spreadsheet. I'm just going to move this over. Since it is generic, you guys will get to see my spreadsheet that I see when I download the results. All right, so uh, let's take a look. Problem number one, equipment grounding conductor. So these are some of the answers. So we got a number four, a four gauge uh, circuit conductors with 10 equipment grounding conductor. Uh, I have a number six. So this guy here, number six, unit one and number six, so that's what I had. You don't want a number eight. And you know what? Some of this, I got six. Some of this might be the temperature that you used um, to calculate this. I probably should have asked. I got number six is number six. I got number six. I got a number eight for the first one. I got a number two. Woo. Wow. All right. So I got a number six. I'm going to move this on the side. I'm going to minimize that. Da -bum. And I got to do this. So my profile, I'm just going to bring up my uh, subscription here. Bear with me one second. All right. So my answer is a number six. Take a look at the chats. Anybody disagree with me? My logic, impacity. I see people still arguing about uh, <laughs> THWN. That's okay. Yep, impacity from the 75 degree solemn can be used for derating. Yes. So because I'm using this, because it's in a wet location, because I am at a THWN, uh, THHN, I am basing my numbers off of the 75 degree C column. All right. I'm going to look on Facebook. See if anybody out there disagrees with my numbers, with my number six. Joe Andre, this, the NEC does not require an equipment ground. Ooh, if the designer specifies the size of the EGC, follow that. Or if he or she specifically calls out for it to be sized per 250, 122 A and C, the table. Ah, so Mr. Andre is saying because they're in a raceway, they don't need that equipment grounding conductor because it is in a metal conduit. If I believe is that is that what you're saying, Mr. Josepity? Wire type can be any size you want. Since IMC is a code compliant EGC per 250 and actually provide a lower impedance ground fault current path. Yes, the uh, metal conduit and per GEMI. There's some great information right there in that post. Um, Yep, something like 80% to 90% of fault current will travel on the raceway with threaded connections. That's that's some good information, Joe, and you're absolutely right. I went through this. Again, I'm doing this as, as an analysis to say, here's how we calculate the equipment grounding conductor size if we were, uh, and, and I think the engineer required one in each. But to your point, Joe, because they're, it depends on the raceway that they're using and uh, threaded conduits, all that good stuff. An EGC is required, but the, yes, the metal conduit is an EGC. You're absolutely right. Yeah, you do need it. In this case, you don't need it. In this case, you obviously need an equipment grounding conductor, but you're leveraging the, um, the metal uh, raceway conduit. Excellent. Good, good, good feedback. All right, so number six. Nobody's disagreeing with a number six, so I'm at a, I'm at a, um, I'm at a six gauge. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, unit two, minimum circuit ampacity of 18. And I do the same correction factors. They're all in the same raceway. I do 18 divided by 0.7. I get 25.7. I do uh, 25.7 divided by 0.94. I get 27.4. And then from 310.16, I have a, a, a 10 gauge conductor. 
uh, which is 35 amps at 75 degrees C. So I'm in a 10 on that one. So my first one is a six. My second one is a 10. Uh, unit two, a number 10. So I'm looking at my spreadsheet. Uh, from my submitters, I have uh, unit one, number six, unit two, number 10. All right, so unit, unit one, number six, uh, copper, and number 10. Right, that looks good. Uh, this, this gentleman here had the, I'm not sure what that is. Unit one, eight, I got a number six, and number two, a 14. And I'm doing a 10, so I'm not sure about this one. And I don't think that one's right. Same size as the current carrying conductor for the uh, Kuma grounding conductors. Unit one. Looks like everybody put, uh, all right, so this would be unit two. 10, ah, okay. Ungrounded for number two, 10, 10, 10, 10. Uh, this guy's got a 12. This guy has, um, they put the numbers in there, 1.25, 10, 75 degrees C. So we got some people got it right. Some people didn't get it right. I still got some number 12s in there for the number for, uh, for the uh, ungrounded uh, conductor sizes. Must comply with the requirements in 251.22. It sounds like Tom said otherwise. That is why I posted the question. I'm not sure what, raceways get damaged and broken. Okay, I'm looking at the uh, chat on, um, on webex now so this i i got uh you know squirrel 110 14 pushes you to 60 degrees c uh if more than one equipment grounding conductor exists they almost comply with 250 are you saying i right, install a wire type egc and a metal raceway that the, that is an egc i can make the wire egc any size i want to i wouldn't say that the egc size must comply with 250 122 that's correct uh, even if you uh, RMC issues, yep, the raceway gets damaged and broken. All right. Okay, so that is uh, that is that one. So I got a number 10. It looks like everybody else got a number 10. Let's move. Move forward. Maybe, uh, I'm going to move some things around here. Let's go to the next one. Unit 3. So unit three is uh, 59 amps is your minimum circuit ampacity. I, again, do the multipliers, divide that by 0.7, I get 84.3. I adjust for temperature, divide by 0.94, I get 89.7. I go to 310.16, and I get a three-gauge conductor for 100 amps. So let's take a look at, uh, first of all, let's take a look at uh, what uh, our Excel spreadsheet says. Or... Unit number three, ungrounded conductors. I said a three. We got a three. We've got an eight. We have a four. We have a three. We have a two. We have a one odd. Wow. Um, we've got a number four. And we've got a number four. We got a number four. Well, I put a number three in because of the temperature values that I use, 94 degrees. I'm sorry, yeah, 94 degrees. I got a 0.94 multiplying factor from that table, 0.7. So I came up with um, a number three. And I'm not sure if the reason why some of those others didn't align uh, is because of um, because of the uh, uh, temperature you know, correction factor of 0.94. I'm not sure what they used there. Uh, but that's basically the process of getting the right ampacity value for... Uh, for the conductor and then picking from 310.16 the right conductor for for this application. So minimum circuit ampacities are listed across the top. I have the um, I have the 0.7 uh, current carrying conductor adjustment factors. I have my temperature correction factors. I have my adjusted ampacity and then I have my conductor sizes a 6, a 10, and a 3. Right now if I use THWN-2, uh, so I did do the math on that one. Ah, okay, so Keith, Van, Van Dorn says uh, uh, a three gauge is not stocked cable size. We would increase it to a number two. All right, well, you know, and, and uh, you'd have to do the math. Um, 
uh, Keith, you'd have to do the math. If you're doing that because you didn't have it on the truck, I mean, forget about whether or not it's stocked. Uh, your your supply house may or may not have it. It could be that uh, you didn't have that on the truck and you use something different because you had a number three or something different on the truck. That's going to be an important factor when you start sizing your equipment grounding conductor. All right, so now I did uh, do the math with regard to using a THWN-2. And only in one case did it let me go down. And, and, and that's where I came up with the number 12. For unit one and three, uh, even using the 90 degree C column, I did not uh, I did not get a different number for the other two based upon the factors that I used. So um, unit two, I was able to go from a 10 to a, a 12. So, and, and, and so that's why I think it's important that you it may be that you're where that the warehouse only has THWN-2 90 degree C and that's what you're using. Uh, whether you used uh, THWN or THHN versus dash two, it, it, in, in, at least in these three applications, it wouldn't have made a difference anyway. All right, so now we've got to think about the uh, branch circuit, uh, the protection from a short circuit pr perspective. Um, I'm using the um, uh, the ma maximum overcurrent protection size, 50, 25, and 70. I could simply go with that and say, I'm gonna use a 50 amp breaker, or a 50 amp fuse, a 25 amp breaker, 25 amp fuse, and a 70 amp breaker. And then you may say, well, hold on. You're using a 50 amp breaker on a number six, which is, uh, well, number six is 65, so that's not too bad. Um, uh, see, a 25 amp breaker on a number 12. That would be uh, 35, but I'm using a number 10. That's 35, a 70. Yep. So, if I, so if you look at uh, a 70 amps breaker on your number three. Yep. So, so you are picking your over your short circuit protection based upon, upon those. Uh, unit three would go to a number four using THWN dash two. All right. Yeah. I'll I'll trust you on that, Eddie. Uh, on a hard money job, we use a number three instead of going up to number two. Or Dan. Dan Cadigan. So uh, do the math on those. I did the math really quick last night. I could have used the wrong column in my calculation. Uh, so unit two and three, you may have uh, been able to change. I'm not sure. You can check that out and just use the use the uh, 90 degree C column for for that uh, calculation. All right. All right. So now a minimum circuit ampacity uh, for I've got. Uh, so, so the other thing we have to do to, in, in looking at your equipment grounding conductors, you're going from, I, if, if I didn't do any adjustment, I would have used the number eight. With the adjustments, I had to increase the size to a number six. So what you have to do is go to article 250, 250, 122. There is 250, 250.122, um, I think it's B, 250, yep, 250.122B says increase in size. If an ungrounded conductors, if ungrounded conductors are increased in size for any reason other than as required in 31015B or C, 31015B or C, let's take a look at what 31015B or C is. 31015B is ambient uh, correction factors. Uh, C is adjustment factors. Wire type equipment grinding conductors, if installed, shall be increased in size uh, proportionally to the increase in circular mill area. All right. So what I did now, so what I did here was I did the increase in size of the equipment grinding conductor based upon. Um, so if I, if I don't do any adjustment factors, I'm at an eight, but I did, uh, I have a number six, I have a number 10, I have a number three, but we pick the equipment grounding conductor size based upon the overcurrent protective device, not the, uh, uh, the size of the uh, ungrounded conductors, right? Uh, but if uh, 250.122C, 250.122B, if ungrounded conductors are increased in size for any reason other than as required in 31015 B or C. 31015 B or C, that is what we just did. 31015 
B is ambient correction, and C, adjustment factors for more than three current carrying conductors, uh, the adjustment factors. So we've done that uh, for anything other than that. So if I'm adjusting for, uh, for ambient and for temperature correction, I don't have to increase the size of the equipment grounding conductor. Now, if I'm on an earlier code, I had to do that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think 250.122, 250.122, C, 250.122, A, 250.122, B, where ungrounded conductors are increased in size from the minimum size that has sufficient capacity for the intended installation. Wire type equipment grounding conductors where installed shall be increased in size proportionately. So that was a... Um, if I was on the 2017 code, I'm going to get my numbers right. If I was on the 2017 NEC, I would be increasing these. So I'm showing, I'm going to show you um, both of both ways. You know, if I, if I don't, or if I do, so I have both of those numbers, depending upon what version of the code you are in or on. All right. So if, if I'm increasing those conductor sizes, if I did it for voltage drop, I would have to be increasing my uh, equipment grounding conductor size. If I did it for, um, um, for any other reason, if I had it, uh, if it, I just had it on the truck um, and it wasn't had nothing to do with uh, temperature or anything like that, I would be increasing the equipment grounding comply. It did, I think in 19... Uh, so, so Ryan, you're saying it didn't apply in 2017? Well, if I read, I'm, I've got the 17 code, 250.122B says, where ungrounded conductors are increased in size from the minimum size that has sufficient ampacity for the intended installation, wire type equipment grounding conductors, where installed, shall be increased in size proportionately according to the circular mill area of the ungrounded conductor. So it doesn't say like it says in the 20 code where 20 code says if ungrounded conductors are increased in size for any reason other than as required in 310.15 B or C. Let's take a look at the 14 code. If you're adjusting the conductor ampacity, that is the minimum size conductor. Oh, I don't know about that, Don. I don't know about that. Uh, you, 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 okay, so you, you might, you might, uh, you might be right there. You, I see what you're saying. So, what what Don Ganier is saying, and I think what you're saying, Ryan, is if I look at the like a 17 code, it says. It says increased in size from the minimum size that has sufficient ampacity for the intended installation. And ampacity is based upon conditions of use. Right. So because it's the, based on conditions of use, I would not have to increase the size of the equipment grounding conductor <clears throat> because my conditions of use include the, um, uh, the um, ampacity adjustment based on temperature and the opacity adjustment uh, or the uh, the adjustment based upon uh, numbers of current carrying conductors. Good point, Don and Ryan, thanks. All right, take a look. Oh, and I have the text right here. So if ungrounded conductors are increased in size for any reason other than uh, that in B or C. So I would not now, I put in I put in both of these. So with adjustment factors, um, uh, the six, the, the number six is 62.3. With adjustment factors, the current carrying conductors of that, I have a number six. I increased that by 159%, but I don't have to do that. I don't know why, what the heck. I didn't have to do that. So anyway, um, that math, if you, if, you, if you came up with a number eight, uh, because of the percent increase, you didn't have to do that because of this language right here, because it says uh, for anything other than 31015B uh, or C. I got a little carried away. 
So if you go to 250, let's go back to 250 and come up with the equipment grounding conductor size based upon uh, the MOP is 50, so I would be in a number 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll be in a number 10 uh, based upon the size of that. I did it both ways for you. So I have the number 10 up at the top, right up here. And you may have come up with an answer of a number eight. And if you did, you if you came up with this answer, you went through the, the increasing in the ungrounding conductor size by 159%, but you wouldn't have to do that in this case because uh, even in, like we said in the 17, I was thinking in the 17 you had to do it, but uh, you're right, uh, 250.122 mentions that it's based upon the impacity, which is based on the conditions of use, which includes that. So you, would, you wouldn't use a number eight, you could use a number 10. And let's take a look, hold on, number 10. I've got a number, I've got a number eight. I don't have to go anything greater than a number eight than my ungrounded conductor size. I can go smaller. And in this case, I'm using a number 10, All right? So for unit number two, uh, let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at what we had uh, on my, uh, now we're gonna look at the spreadsheet again. And we're gonna go to see, uh, what did we have? So there's the uh, wire size. Or put up, put up, put up. On, I gotta go minus. Get it out big enough here so I can bring this over. All right. So the equipment grounding size, uh, unit one is. Uh, we've had a number six. I got a number eight. I got a number six. I got a number ten. I got a number ten. <clears throat> I've got a number ten. So that's what I would pick is a number ten. Anybody disagree with a number ten? Let me know. Looking out on the things, uh, uh, Ryan, did you did you do the math? Dawn, did you do the math? Did you do number ten? You agree with a number ten for for a uh, <clears throat> excuse me for number I think it was number one, right? Number ten for a fifty amp overcurrent device. Number two is a twenty five amp overcurrent device. So if I look at two fifty. Uh, I have uh, 25 amp, so I'm still at a number 10 for table 250, per table 250, 122. Um, I have my circular mills, and it was still a number 10, even if you X, even if you tried to do the upgrade, you were still doing a number 10. <clears throat> because that would be the max. You don't have to go greater than um, your, uh, after your adjustment factors, it's a number 10, so I wouldn't have to go uh, to a larger size conductor greater than a number 10 because 250.122 charging text says, <clears throat> excuse me, copper, aluminum, or copper clad aluminum equipment grounding conductors of the wire type shall not be smaller than shown in table 251.22. Um, the equipment grounding conductor shall not be required to be larger than the circuit conductors supplying the equipment. So if I'm at a number 10 and... Uh, uh, if my uh, ungrounded conductor is a number 10, and even if you went through and did this math, if, say it was for voltage drop, and if your, if your adjustment factor uh, for voltage drop or any other reason other than, you know, because you had it on the truck, so to speak, um, <clears throat> you would, um, and you went, didn't have to do this for adjustment for, for the uh, current carrying conductors in a conduit or because of uh, ambient uh, temperature, then uh, you would not go larger than a number a number 10 because that's what your ungrounded conductor is. All right. So the right answer here, again, is still going to be that equipment grounding conductor of a 10 with the ungrounded conductor as a 10 for unit number two. Let's take a look at the... Uh, at my Mentimeter for unit number two. So that was unit number one. Let's scroll over to unit number two, equipment grounding conductors, 10. I've got a 10. <clears throat> I've got a six, and I believe that's probably, let me take a look at my derating factor. For number two, even if you did the derating, you would be in a four. If you did that by mistake, you would be in a four. 
Uh, there's a number four there. He probably did. Uh, he probably did the uh, adjustment factor. He probably did the increase in circular mills. Didn't have to. A uh, number ten. A number ten. Number ten. Number ten. Number ten. So uh, looks like ten wins on that one. I don't know if there's anybody out there who agrees or disagrees, but uh, that's what I'm going to go with. I had my druthers. Take a look at my chat. Uh, yep, number ten. All right, Ryan, David Engelhart, number ten. If conductors, uh, if the conductors for unit number two were number twelve on a twenty-five amp overcurrent protected device, the equipment grounded conductor would only need to be a number twelve. That is true. That is true. So number twelve. Hold on. If the equipment, if the conductors for unit two were number twelve. Unit two is 25. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I don't, why did I have a 14? Yeah, yeah, I typed. That's a, that's a typo there, I think. This, uh, that number, that's a good catch. This number right here should be, because my minimum circuit ampacity is 18 yeah i could have used uh what did i have i had a number 14 number 14 is uh 20 amps and that's not a 90 degree c conductor so i, I think I, I i don't think i put that in correctly it would be number 12 25 25 overcurrent over current protective device and pass that's right all right good good one thank you david Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Let me do a clear on this one. Grace all. All right. So let's do unit number three. Uh, minimum circuit ampacity is 59, and the maximum overcurrent protect device is uh, 70. So. Uh, I would, my ungrounded conductor with no adjustment factors is a six gauge. Uh, with the adjustment factors, I'm moving that down up to a three because of uh, 89.7, and, and we already talked about all of that. Now, um, let's take a look. So uh, the right answer for this one is your eight. So your equipment grounding conductor is going to be based upon the overcurrent device, and that's going to be an eight uh, if you... Uh, if you increased it because of the adjustment factors, which you didn't have to, you may have an answer of a number four. So let's take a look and see how many people have a number four as opposed to a number eight. All right, scroll over to the right. The equipment grounding conductor size on unit three. I got number eight. I got number six. There's the number four guy. Number six, number six, number eight, number eight. So it looks like... We're a little bit around all over the board there, uh, but that's okay. Um, let's take a look at. Um, I mean, so if I'm at a, if I'm at seventy amps, I'm trying to see how how would you make a how would you how would you if I'm at seventy amps. Uh, so so a number eight. I'm just trying to understand the number six is in there. The number six, they could have used uh, aluminum or copper clad aluminum, right? But I did mention copper in the in the problem. So they, but they could have been using the uh, the copper clad aluminum uh, or aluminum conductor uh, column in table two fifty dot one twenty two. Just trying to see what the number four is uh, if they did. Uh, yeah, see, see, so this 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 gentleman here did the adjustment factors, right? So they probably they probably did the adjustment, but uh, and the, these number six people probably I wouldn't say that they would be, it would be a wrong answer because it could be using the aluminum column in two fifty dot one twenty two, but it should be a, a you know a number eight would be the right one based on two fifty one twenty two because we base that off of the um, rating or setting of the overcurrent protective device which uh, in this case is 70 
And uh, yeah, I go from 60 to 100, so I would be into a number eight. All right. Okay, so so uh, we got a little bit of everybody covered. Uh, we I think we understand where the number six may have come from on some of those answers. We know where this number four came from. I should have also included uh, in here. I tried to cover all my bases so that I could see in the spreadsheet based upon the Mentimeter what types of uh, mistakes uh, would be made. Uh, I see David Engelhardt. Whoops, my bad. Number eight's good for 100 amps. Yep. Uh, so use number 10 for the ungrounded conductors because that's required. Therefore, a 10 a equipment grounding conductor is required. Absolutely right. Yep. All right. So I'm just looking at the information there. So, all right. So, all right. So what we, what we've gone through so far is, um, I'm, just, I'm going to take a look at the, hold on. I'm looking at my, uh, chat. I haven't looked at, I've been looking at uh, YouTube chats and my, my Facebook chats, but I haven't been looking at the, um, WebEx chat. We can buy number three. Looks like they're talking about where they're who who's stocking what conductors, and that does play a really important role uh, to what conductor that you use. Uh, must comply with requirements in two fifty one twenty two, but it sounds like Tom said otherwise. No, it does have to uh, comply with two fifty one twenty two. Dawn, I I agree with that. Don't you have? And I may have misspoken there, um, but uh, you do have to follow two fifty one twenty two. Don't have to use a sixty degree amp these for circuits one hundred amps or less. Yep. Uh, Keith Van Dorn, number three is not stocked. All right, not true. Uh, and then there's some debates going on whether they can get a three all, all day long. And everybody's supply house is going to be different. So, and 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 what you have on the truck is going to be totally different. But here's what I, I yep. So can you can you buy it for suppliers that clients is not stocked? It costs more to take. All right, there's so there's a there's some discussion about cost. Unit three could go to a number four using T. Yeah, okay. I got that. I remember that comment about lowering it based upon using a 90 degree C insulation. That's an important thing you got to remember when you're starting this uh, adjustment factors. Um, all right. Other cable manufacturers may have stocked. Yep. So we still have the stocking discussion. All right. So that's all I got going on there. Let me just take a look out here in Facebook again. Just to make sure I got all the comments. I got the participants. All right. So. I got Joe Andre out there talking. There's an argument that sized for sufficient ampacity includes temperature correction and current carry conductor gives you sufficient ampacity. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So they had that discussion and not everybody agreed on that. Well, you know, and, and, and Joe, I, I know there's a debate in that, and that's one of the reasons why I did it both ways. Um, the other reason was I just, uh, wanted to see what you guys were saying. And, uh, you know, so, and and I know when I do the Mentimeter thing, I, someone was going to have different numbers, and I, I should have thought about the aluminum as well. So it could be that those individuals are using aluminum. So this is sort of how it how it rolls out. Um, <clears throat> I've got my 50, 25, and 70 uh, with no adjustment factors, uh, et cetera, right? So I've got my minimum circuit opacities. I'm going to hold on here. So those are my numbers. I did my circular mills and the increase. So I show you the size uh, based upon all of the numbers. And you understand, hopefully, where we get all those numbers now. Uh, if you didn't understand how I did the percentage, I basically, what, 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 if, you're, if, you're, if you were required to do that, and, and, and if you, you may have done that, and if you're, to, like, to Joe's point, you don't think that, um, uh, that, that, that uh, you can get out of 25122B, what you would do is look at the circular mills without the adjustments here. Uh, that's what you're basing off of. You look at the percent increase of the circular mills of no adjustment factor to with the larger conductor size. That's 158.93% increase. I would have to take 158%, 1.5893 times the circular mills of that number 10 to get 16,497. And, and remember that the circular mills I'm getting out of table eight in the National Electrical Code. Table eight has all your circular mills. Once I do that math, I go into table eight for, with 16,497 and find the conductor size that is larger than uh, uh, has a circular mills greater than 16,497, 
and that's would get me to a number eight, which is 16, 5, 10. So that would apply if you're going to do that. But as you can see, there's a debate with regard to whether or not you have to do it. And Ryan and, and, uh, and others have pointed out that based upon the language in 251.22b, increase in size, that it says where, when you, I think they clarified it a little bit in the 2020 code, right? Because it says, if ungrounded conductors are increased in size for any reason other than the impacity, which is the only two uh, adjustments that we did. So if, if you're on the 2020 code, I think they made it crystal clear. If you're on the 17 code, you can probably make that mistake, or I don't know if it's a mistake or not. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at what, the, what they did in the 2020 code, I would say the, the intent was not to require increasing that equipment grounding conductor size based upon uh, the ampacity calculations. So in any case, I would still ask you, why do you even need to increase it at all? Even for voltage drop. I'm still, my verdict is still out on that one. I don't know that you have to uh, increase the size of that equipment grounding conductor. But in any case, that's a different argument. All right. You can install a smaller overcurrent protected device than that 50, 25, and 70 if you wanted to. The limiting factor on how small you can go, you would have to... Um, you would have to make sure that your unit will start because as you lower the overcurrent protective device, you're moving the instantaneous uh, trip to the left to lower current values, and you have motors in there and whatnot, so that could trip your overcurrent protective device. Now, there's two other factors you got to think about: the short circuit current rating of that equipment, and then if if GFCI protection is required in 210.8. The short circuit current rating of the equipment is based upon um, 440.10. So if I go back to 440, 440.10, the title of that section, well, it's right there, short circuit current rating. I'm going to read you, there's, there's an A and B to 440.10. A says, motor controllers or industrial control panels of multimotor and combination load equipment shall not be installed where the available fault current exceeds its short circuit current rating as marked in accordance with 440.4b. Now, technically, you don't need to say that because you've got 110.10, right? 110.10 tells us that we can't apply a product outside of its rating. 110.3b uh, tells us that. Uh, but in any case, they put that in there because it, it gets missed a lot on HVAC equipment. And in the 2017 code, they said they added a 440.10b. It says, when motor controllers or industrial control panels of multi-motor and combination load equipment are required to be marked with a short circuit current rating, the available fault current and the date that the available fault current calculation was performed shall be documented and made available to those authorized to inspect, install, or maintain the installation. So uh, I've got to make sure I'm, I'm going to have to document my available short circuit current and I'm going to have to mark it with its short circuit current rating, and someone has to do that comparison, and it's probably going to be an electrical inspector. But that's just a, a new requirement that was in the 17 cycle that required the calculation of that fault current and providing it. It's not required to be marked, but it is required to be documented and made available to the, um, to the authority having jurisdiction. All right. Um, uh, 210.8F is a new requirement that was put in the code in the 2020 cycle. Uh, panel 2 did their voodoo on uh, ground fault. And if you uh, looked at my Code Changes uh, YouTube video, it's probably in the first one uh, where we covered uh, Chapter 2. Uh, but 210.8F, uh, I think it is. Yep, F, outdoor outlets. Uh, all outdoor outlets or dwellings. For dwellings. Now, this application, this application is air conditioning units on a roof, three of them. If your house is big enough to have three air conditioning units, like Ryan Jackson's house is, or Joe Andre's house, or 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 you know, one of those guys is or Keith Laughlin's house, you know, those guys have huge homes. They got three or four air conditioning units up there. But I would say more often than not, if you've got three air conditioning units and a, con and a raceway conduit going up to the roof, you're probably not in 
a uh, dwelling unit application. But in any in any case, all outdoor outlets for dwellings, other than those covered in 210.8A3, exception to three, and remember, A is dwelling units, A3 is outdoors, and the exception for the outdoors that has to deal with when you have a receptacle outlet that is um, not readily accessible, and if you have uh, GFPE requirements on there for de-icing. Um, so, uh, so other than those uh, that are supplied by a single phase branch circuit rated 150 volts to ground or less, 50 amps or less, shall have ground fault circuit interrupter protection uh, for personnel. Uh, now, uh, you know, what we did was we, we also put an exception. So technically, we could have made two exceptions and take and and probably with if you're writing code language, the less exceptions and informational notes you have, the better the language is, right? The parent text. But in any, I mean, we could argue that all day long. Uh, but we have another exception: ground fault circuit interrupter protection shall not be required on lighting outlets other than those covered in 210.8C. And the lighting outlets in 210.8C are your crawl space lighting outlets. So if you have uh, that application, but uh, uh, any other lighting outlet, you don't have to GFCI protect on uh, on the outside. But uh, this was put in because there was a death around um, touching that air handling unit on the outside of, of a house. All right, so let's take a look at some questions. Um, and that, 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 so that's that's sort of uh, that's that's those were the answers to that program. Thanks to those who uh, came up and did the math. I'm going to look at these questions. Uh, and uh, give you some more information on that. Uh, so let's, um, it is 155. So the next five minutes, I'm not going to put the code up there yet. I'm going to take a look at some questions. All right. Let's take a look on Facebook. Uh, four copper shouldn't be required for the language in 220. Ah, okay, Joe. So you were saying shouldn't be required. I thought you were saying it should. All right, so, yep, I agree with you. I'm looking at uh, no comments out there on uh, Facebook that we haven't addressed already. Uh, let's take a look. I still have an excellent connection on YouTube. Let's take a look at my YouTube, um, YouTube questions. So let's do this. Bum, 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 bum. Control Q. All right, so YouTube questions. Wait, uh, I thought a number eight was good for up to 60 amps. There is 70 for unit three. Whoops, my bad, number eight. Okay, yep, so I remember that. I used three uh, based on higher ambient temperature than what you used. Ah, okay. So again, the ambient temperature that you use is going to be important. So let me ask you. So Ryan, David, uh, anybody else out there, where do you get the ambient temperatures and what is recognized from an authority having jurisdiction, an AHJ perspective? I talked to two AHJs um, as I was working through these problems. And one AHJ said that, um, that, uh, that they don't think that anybody is even adjusting for ambient. Um, and they were saying that... Um, Ah, all right. And, and they were saying that uh, that uh, those who did, there was a debate from a local jurisdiction perspective, from, from the government perspective, um, on what they were going to recognize uh, for the ambient adjustment factor. So Ryan's saying ASHRAE, uh, so ASHRAE, the ASHRAE site. Where do you see that? That's in uh, informational note 310.15. Informational note in 310.15. Bada bing, bada boom. Uh, for conductors, uh, air for conductor area, uh, we see that for the impasses of flexible cords, for the explanation of type letters, ambient interruption, temperature information. Note, one source for ambient temperature. So it says one source in various locations is the ASHRAE handbook. All right, so uh, so that's one source. That doesn't mean that it has to come out there. And and, and again, informational notes. Um, um, uh, informational notes are not really enforceable anyway, but uh, so Ryan says, in all honesty, he sees much fewer raceways on rooftops and for the short length that they are, 
you can often use exception to 310.14a2 to get you out of it. Ah, that's true. Uh, and, and what he's pointing, pointing out, I think somebody uh, pointed out 310.15b. Yep. B3c. B. B. B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B three C ten dot three ten dot fifteen B three C three ten dot fifteen B I've only got a one and two so I'm not sure where you're talking uh David ten dot fifteen so um three ten dot fourteen A two that's a good point I think we mentioned that already um, 310.14 A2 talks about where more than one ampacity applies for a given circuit length, the lowest value shall be used. Uh, the exception is where different ampacities apply to portions of a circuit. The higher ampacity shall be permitted to be used if the total portion of the circuit with the lower ampacity does not exceed uh, 10 foot or 10% of the total circuit. So, uh, you're going to do the math, and I tell you what, uh, you'll probably want to do that math based upon how high it will uh, raise the, the 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 job dollars, right? All right, uh, David, the 125% is included in the minimum circuit capacity per 440. Yes. Uh, so, David Egelhart, what section in the National Electrical Code does it tell you that that 125% is included in the minimum circuit capacity? And and let me ask you another thing. Uh, where where in 440 does it tell you that you can use the marked maximum overcurrent protective device? I've marked both of those sections, but I'd love to know from David or Ryan or uh, anybody else out there in Facebook land. Um, Facebook land, Mr. Um, Val, if you have a, um, any input on that, if you're still out there, Joe, if you're still out there, what section in 440? Uh, tells me that I can use the minimum circuit ampacity and not have to do the 1.25 that's marked on the unit. Oh, here we go. Ryan, 440.4B. Let me see. Let me see. See if that's what I circled. 440.4B. I'm going to go on American Idol. 440.4B. All right. So, yeah. So, so. Bum, 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 bum. I got 440.4b and then 440.7, 440.4, 440.7. Highest rate is largest rate is motor. 440.7 is going to push you back to 430. So let's take a look at Ryan's stuff. So 440.4b says multi-motor and combination load equipment, which I would say that is what this is, right? Um, because you've got, uh, it's a self-contained unit. It's a piece of equipment is what it is shall be provided with a visible nameplate marked with the maker's name, the rating volts, frequency, and the number of phases, minimum supply circuit, conductor ampacity, the maximum rating of the branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protective device, and the short circuit current rating of the motor controller or industrial control panel. The ampacity shall be calculated by using part four and counting all the motors and other loads that will be operated at the same time. The branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection device shall not exceed the value calculated by using part three. All right, so let's take a look at what part three is. Part three is your branch circuit, short circuit, and ground fault protection. So, so um, uh, Ryan 440.4b just puts me back to uh, part three. Multimotor, the branch circuit, short, the multimotor or combination load equipment for use on two or more circuits shall be marked with the above information for each circuit. Multimotor and combination that is suitable under the provisions. I'm looking at the exception. Shall be permitted to be marked as a single load. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? Um, while we're talking, I am going to um, display. I am going to display the, uh, for those who are want to get out of here while we uh, debate and discuss this. I'm displaying the Menti code for everybody uh, for the exit. Uh, but I want to continue this discussion because I'm looking at 440.4, 440, and I'm telling you, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm, it's confusing. It is absolutely confusing. It tells the manufacturer that they must do the math. Uh, so, so what does it tell them that though? Uh, what it tells them, it says that the minimum circuit capacity has to be marked on there, right? 
but it says where protective uh, it says the ampacity shall be calculated. The ampacity shall be calculated by using part four and counting all the motors and other loads. So I guess you could interpret, you know, I read that a couple different ways and I've talked to three different people now and they, they didn't even know, they, they didn't reference this, they referenced something else in here. Um, I look back at 440.35 that says multimotor and combination load equipment, the ampacity of the conductors supplying multimotor and combination load equipment shall not be less than the minimum circuit ampacity marked on the equipment in accordance with 440.4b. So, so in, in, in that, so what it does for you, uh, Ryan, I, I agree with you, 440.4b tells you that, but 440.4b tells you you still need to go back to part three and calculate the ampacity of that circuit. But fortunately, in part three, 440.35 makes it very clear that you are not be to not to be less than what's marked on the equipment. So it, Tom, can I can I unmute yeah. myself? One yeah, second? please, please. 440.4b is not a requirement that the installer does. It's a requirement for the manufacturer. It says the manufacturer has to have a nameplate. Yep. They have to tell you the minimum conductor and the maximum ground fault and short circuit. And those calculations that the manufacturer is required to do are based on the required calculations of part three and part four. Where, where does it tell you that the the, the calc that the manufacturer has to make the calculations? I don't read that. It says because it says, because it, says it has to have. It, that's what 440.4b says. It has to have a nameplate. The nameplate has to tell you who built the product, mm -hmm. what the voltage is, what the minimum circuit opacity is, uh, maximum ground fault short circuit, and other information. And then it tells the manufacturer how to derive those values using Article 440. Yeah. So the electrician need only look at the nameplate because the mathematics are already done in accordance with the code. Yeah, so I, I've had... so. I've had, again, three different people read that differently. <laughs> and now, okay, and, and you're the fourth now. So so I went back, and, and, and I went back to uh, 440.35, which says that the impasse of the conductor is supplying the multimotor and combination load equipment, which that's what this is, right? And that was the other question I had is, how do I know what this air handling, what this AC unit is? Well, because it has a motor and it also has a fan. It's it, there. It's a multi. It's combination load equipment. Okay. So, but but there's. I can't look at a label on that equipment, right? I can't look at the at the label on that AC unit, and it's not going to say this is a multi-motor combination load equipment. And I, at least, I, and I and I had to. You know, I just got this label because I asked Donnie for a label because I couldn't find one that was good. But um, uh, but in any case. Uh, 440.35 makes it really clear that 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 that's what I do. Now, what about the maximum overcurrent protection device? The maximum overcurrent protection device is already calculated on the nameplate, as required by by B, which requires compliance with Part Four. Part yeah. Three, rather. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and that's the that's the reference I had too. But I and that that's a lot more. I guess that's that's a little bit more. For some reason, in my mind, that's a lot more clear than it, than the minimum circuit ampacity. And I don't, well, I'll, I'll tell you where this gets really difficult is for the branch circuit. You go right off of four forty point four B, because that tells you that the manufacturer has to do it, so you can use their answers. But where it gets tricky is to do a feeder circuit because nothing in Article four forty addresses feeders. Yeah. So you have to go back to Article four thirty. To do a feeder circuit right. using the values that you got from Article 440. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very difficult article, no question. It absolutely is, and you know, and and I was, I was uh, g walking through this, and and I was uh, venting uh, last night to Donnie Cook. I was venting, and 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 uh, and a little bit this morning because I was like, "Hey, gummit, 440." In my opinion, these, and he even said the same thing because I, because a lot of what's in 440 is assumes that all of these parts and pieces are all over the place and you're calculating all these you know uh, all the different types of configurations but if you have an a, a self-contained unit they do a great job on uh 
on uh, uh, part f or part seven for uh, for room air conditioners. I mean, that's that's very clear. If it's a room air conditioner, I know what a room air conditioner is. I can go to four. I can go to part seven, and it gives me my rules and everything associated with that. But once you start dealing with these other equipment, it's just. I just wish it was. I just wish it was clear. And and you know, it could just be a lack of education. Um, I'm looking at. I got a. I got a label right here. All right, so and so it does say combination cooling and heating unit. So I do have the word combination on there. So if I read that, uh, that would put me into um, listed central cooling air conditioner. So that I see what the listing mark is. I've got my listed, and it does say, but this is a CSA mark. Says a combination cooling. So if it's not CSA listed, so let's take that off. What else in this label? tells me that it would be a combination load other than me looking at it knowing like you said I know there's a fan in there I know there's a compressor in there I know all this other stuff that's inside that unit but well on the bottom left in your photograph and you can't see exactly what you need but it looks to me like it says condenser on the extreme bottom left right where it cuts off Factory and then charge, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing under that it says fan and that would be your combination. But if your if your graphic went up another half inch, I think would be there. Uh, yeah, I think it. You know, and it may because uh, hold on, I'm just going to hit escape since hopefully everybody got their uh, their code. I don't know if anybody's yelling. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Oh man, sorry about that. Um, let me just come over here and pull this picture because I think what I did was I cropped it. Format, crop. Yeah, I did. So I know I have an evaporator motor. I know I have a condensing unit, an evaporator standard, an evaporator oversized. So there's, you know, full load amps, three different uh, motors in there, and their horsepower ratings. So it's a multi-motor type of deal. So, so I, I do have, um, I do have more information on here, but uh, and there's heaters, specific heaters. It just, I mean, they don't make it, you know, they don't make it easy. And which, I guess it doesn't have to be easy. That's, you know, that's why we get paid the big bucks, right? And that's fine. All right. So let me just go back to this last screen for those who want that code. And, and I hope that the example, um, I hope you enjoyed doing the example. I mean, if you didn't do it with me or if you didn't do it before, uh, I personally, I mean, I did that years ago and, um, it really helped me understand this whole discussion point that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, let's take a look on Facebook. Joe Andre's still on there. I think he is. The label usually contains the RLA and LRA of each motor. Yep. I just showed that Joe. If you take that info and multiply by 1.25, you should end up with the minimum circuit capacity. So what, what Joe Andre is saying, you can take that detailed information that's on the label and do what 440 details uh, with the uh, with the continuous current load and all that other good stuff, and come up with um, what the minimum circuit capacity. I didn't do that myself. That's a good exercise uh, to try. Um, but uh, that's that's um, that's good to know. And 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 that was what uh, I mean. When you take a listed piece of equipment, to Ryan's point. They're putting the burden on the manufacturer to say, hey, just tell me what the minimum circuit capacity and maximum overcurrent protective device is for this. You do the math, all that good stuff. Um, overcurrent protective device 440.22. Let's take a look at what 440.22 says. Uh, and I would I would fall back to what uh, 440.4B. That was sort of my my end game, but then I also went back to 440.35. And what David is saying uh, is look back at 440.22 uh, for application selection rating. And, and then there's all of these different things. So they have motor compressors. They have the protective devices not exceeding the manufacturers, individual. And so uh, what they don't have in here in 440.22, I, I think you're covered automatically, obviously, per our discussion, maximum overcurrent protection. But <clears throat> you would have to look through this and to Joe Andre's point, uh, look at what all of those different parts and pieces are and apply 440.22 and you could probably come up with the exact same information that the manufacturer put on the label as long as you have enough information on the um, on the label to do uh, to do what's in 440.22.
Uh, what Joe said is correct. That is what the manufacturer is required to do by 440.b. Yes. Awesome. All right. So I'm looking at my WebEx chat. I'm going to bring that down here now. Uh, WebEx. Uh, <laughs> there's we got a we got a we got an argument or a good discussion going between Kevin and Keith on uh, what is stocked or what is not stocked when it comes to conductors, which which is um, which is a, a a valid point. Which if you think about the two fifty dot one twenty two, if you're increasing the conductor's size for any other reason other than ampacity, uh, for, other than temperature and number of current carrying conductors you need to increase the equipment grounding conductor size. So if you couldn't get what you needed and you increase the size but from the supply house or on the truck, you kind of also need to increase the equipment grounding conductor size. Uh, they don't really care uh, if you did it because of the temperature uh, or, uh, or if, you did it, if you did it because of uh, uh, if it was the only thing that you had on the truck. If you increase the size of that, for, for that reason, you're going to need, need to increase the equipment grounding conductor. And I would love to have a discussion about why. That, uh, I, I have a, uh, I've done the math on it. And I, I it, in, in, in the whole reason for 251.22, I've had people say, I've had, uh, you're, you're either in two uh, you got the Menti code up there, uh, uh, Carl. Uh, you either are in two camps if you're increasing the equipment chronic conductor. You have one camp that says because you've increased the over because you've increased the un ungrounded conductor size, you have the lower impedance, you have higher fault currents flowing through the equipment grounding conductor, and uh, you need to protect that equipment grounding conductor from the higher fault currents. I have another school of thought that says if you've increased the size, you've probably increased it to do voltage voltage drop, which means you have a very long run, which means your uh, your current, your ground fault currents that would go through that equipment grounding conductor are so low they're not going to trip the overcurrent device, and you could damage the equipment grounding conductor. And I don't agree with either. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. Send me an email if you have a passion around that because I'd love to. I, I'm I'm looking for someone to convince me that you need to increase that equipment grounding conductor size. I'm really looking for somebody to increase it to to um, and then you say okay, thanks Ryan. Um, the other the other aspect is um, could I just put GFPE or ground fault circuit interrupter protection on that circuit and not increase the equipment grounding conductor? I don't have any provisions for that either. So if I give you a lower protection and ground fault protection of equipment, or I put GFCI protection on there, four to six milliamps or 30 milliamp GFPE, do I still need to increase the equipment grounding conductor and why? So that's my question to all of you guys and gals out there. Thanks for dialing in. I really appreciate um, everybody's uh, participation and the dialogue uh, was absolutely awesome. Um, I am going to go back to my main screen here if I can get to it. If I can close out of here. Thank you, Dawn. Thanks for participating. Thanks for keeping me honest. And um, all that jazz. That's what I look for. And uh, remember, be safe. Be uh, be healthy. Don't, uh, don't let the bed bugs bite. And uh, don't sneeze on your neighbor. Keep six feet. Practice social distancing network. All right. Thank you very much. I am going to sign out now uh, on our WebEx and our YouTube and our Facebook. I appreciate everybody uh, joining in on the session, providing all of the great chats. Uh, you can't replace that information. We can't replace the fact that we had uh, guys like Joe Andre on the on, on online. We had... Uh, uh, Ryan Jackson online. We had Phil Simmons join us. Jim Arnold, Larry Air joined us. Uh, we we had a powerhouse of individuals out there, and I really appreciate everybody's um, everybody's efforts and and time in 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 playing with this. I, if I didn't get to all your chats, I apologize for that. I do have to jump off of here anyway, and um, 
So good night and good afternoon. And we'll see you tomorrow for our discussion around 70E with Jim Dollard. Uh, please uh, don't forget to send in your questions about 70E. I'm going to be immediately working on that PowerPoint with Jim after this call. Uh, so uh, we are prepared for a great discussion to answer your questions on 70E, safe work practices. Thank you and take care. All right. Thanks for everybody on, uh, on WebEx. I am going to stop sharing now. Boom. I'm going to save the chat and maybe I will try to go back and see if I have any questions that I did not answer or that weren't answered in the chat session. Oh, what I am going to do while I do this for my WebExers who love music, I'm going to give you our, I think X is the outro. Yes, it is. Tuning up the outro. Tuning up the outro.